the gunman was getting more and more agitated. He pointed his weapon at Luna. Pete tugged his stopwatch out of his coat pocket. No, I yelled, but it was too late. He had already pushed the button. Everyone froze. Everyone except us. Just like old man Giles promised. The gunman was statue still. So was Luna. A terrified look etched on her face. I heard Pete sigh in relief beside me. He showed me the watch's digital display. It was counting down from 60 hours. Less than three days. It could have been worse. I'm sure you're confused. Forgive me. The armed robbery just seemed like a dramatic place to start the story. Let's go back to the beginning. Halloween. 40 years ago. I was eight at the time. Pete and Gary were nine. I thought I was so cool because my best friends were in the year above. It was my first time trick-or-treating without my parents. This left us three to throw eggs and flour at houses where the homeowners were clearly in but ignoring us. I'm not proud of this behavior, but we were kids. I know you've always been more sensible and considerate than we ever were. I'm proud of you for that. As the evening wore on, we were so excited talking about all the candy we'd collected that we weren't paying attention to where we were going. We found ourselves on the outskirts of town. It was Pete that suggested knocking on old man Giles' door. Giles was the local madman. He was often seen around town muttering to himself, sometimes chanting in non-existent languages. There were various rumors in circulation. Some claimed he was a wizard. Others said his house was haunted. I didn't want to seem like a wimp in front of Pete, so I went along with it. Gary looked as uneasy as I felt. Giles was ecstatic when he opened the door. He even did a little dance that had us sniggering. I'm delighted you're here, he said in a sing-song voice. I was starting to think nobody would drop by tonight and I have something very special for you. Trick or treat, we all said in unison. Boy, do I have a treat for you, Giles exclaimed. But with power comes great responsibility and consequence. What? Pete grunted. You got any chocolate or not? Giles replied, I've got something far better than chocolate. He pulled out three stopwatches, placing one in each of our buckets on top of our candy. What is that? I asked. I wasn't being rude like Pete. I was genuinely intrigued. These are magic watches, Giles explained. As the new owners of these watches, you and you alone have the ability to stop time. It will only work once per watch. Simply push the button on the top when you want to activate the power. What a load of old bull, Pete laughed. But be warned, Giles continued, ignoring Pete's interjection. Time will freeze for every living creature on Earth, everyone except the three owners of these watches. You will continue aging while the rest of the world sits frozen in time. If you give your watch away to someone else, you pass the power to him or her. You will freeze if and when they use the watch. How long will time stop? Gary asked. It's different for each watch. One stops time for 60 minutes, another 60 hours, and another 60 years. 60 years, Gary said in wonder. Pete muttered, you skipped right past weeks and months then. I don't make the rules, Giles replied. I asked, how will we know which one stops time for 60 years? Giles looked at me with a wild grin. You don't. With that, he slammed the door in our faces. Pete rang the doorbell again and again, but Giles didn't return. What a lunatic, Pete said, throwing an egg at his door. Don't, I warned. You were fine with egging the other houses. No, I mean, push the button on the watch. Ever. Just in case. Oh, you don't believe that, bull? Of course not, but just don't, okay? Whatever. Between you and me, I did believe, 
kind of. I believed enough to carry that watch with me everywhere I went from that day forward, just in case I needed it, but with no real intention of using it at the same time. I didn't want to spend 60 years almost alone with the rest of humanity frozen around me. We now know, despite his bravado, that Pete believed too. Because he had his watch on him 40 years later when a gunman threatened Luna at the gas station where she worked. It was a huge risk, but I understand why he pushed the button. I'd have done it for you, so I can't blame Pete for saving his daughter. If his watch turned out to be the one to stop time for 60 years, I'm sure he would have died during those years with no regrets, in the knowledge that Luna would be alive when time eventually continued. We carried Luna and the other customers away from the gas station and found and wiped the CCTV. I'm glad we had more than 60 minutes to do all that, even though we were fed up by the last day. I was missing you and your mum. It was meant to be your birthday the next day. It was for you, but I had three days to wait. When time resumed, the shooter found himself alone in the gas station, until the police arrived, a minute or two later. Ask Luna about it. She was so confused, but we couldn't tell her the truth. It's up to you if you want to tell her now. I don't know if she'll believe you, but I'm sure it would be a comfort for her to know Pete didn't go missing or abandon her. There's one more detail about the gas station incident I need to mention. Gary was with us that day, but he froze along with everybody else. We couldn't understand it. He was a watch owner, so why did he freeze? At first, I thought it was because Pete was the one that used his watch, but then I would have been frozen too. We asked him about it when time continued. He said he lost his watch years ago. I don't think he fully believed us that Pete's watch worked. But the confusion of Luna and the gas station customers went some way towards convincing him. The police thought trauma was the cause of the confusion among the witnesses. I wish Gary hadn't lost his watch. I should have made sure he took better care of the thing. I'm sorry I failed to do this. I wouldn't be recording this message right now if I had bothered to check Gary was looking after his watch. On Luna's wedding day of all days, I'm so sorry, Evie. I won't be alive in 60 years. I want you to know, I didn't leave you and your mum. I would never leave you. I died. I pray you believe that, as incredible as all this sounds. I hope I can remove this voice recorder from your bag before you find it. And Luna's celebrations only end up pausing for an hour after whoever found Gary's watch pushed the damn button. I hope I get to see you graduate and get married yourself, but in case I don't, you'll find my watch inside the zipped compartment of your bag. It will be for 60 minutes. Use them wisely. I love you, Evie. I was born with a gift, inherited from my father. I discovered my ability when I was seven. I was riding my bike near my house. A car hit my neighbor's cat and drove off. The sweet tabby was alive, but wailing in pain with her leg bent at an unnatural angle. I got closer and could see bone poking through her fur. I planned to run home and get my parents, but first I comforted the cat and told her I was coming back with help, even though I knew she wouldn't understand. I gently stroked her head before touching the leg above the brake with my fingertips. Somehow, I felt powerful in that moment, like there was a force bursting to leave my body. On instinct, I held my palms out flat a few centimeters above the wound. A gold light radiated from my hands. The cat got up and leapt away like nothing had happened, with her broken leg healed. I watched in bewilderment as she dashed across the street to my neighbor's house. There was still blood on the road. I knew I hadn't imagined the whole thing. The next day, I started to feel strange. I was moody at school, isolating myself from my friends. I fantasized about cutting the heads off the other children's teddies. 
I didn't feel myself. When my dad tucked me into bed that night, I asked if he'd ever heard of anything like this, telling him a kid at school said it happened to them. I saw his face drop. That night, he told me he was born with an ability to heal the sick, and he must have passed this down to me. He warned me against using my powers. He said that when we heal a person or animal, we absorb their pain. For us, this doesn't come in the form of physical pain. It's a darkness that infects the soul. Darkness capable of changing who we are. The next morning, my dad took me out to the garden. He placed my hand against a rose and told me to imagine the darkness flowing out of my body like a river. I felt it leave, and I watched as the rose crumpled and died. Dad said because the cat was a small creature and the injury relatively minor, only a small amount of darkness infected me so it was easy to pass on. He warned me that healing a human of a serious condition would create a darkness that couldn't be exhumed through nature. Such darkness could only be passed to another human. Dad thinks this is how some murderers come to be the way they are, although he described them simply as bad people when I was little. Shortly after that, we moved away. I met my best friend at my new school. I had been a sociable child at my old school, but I never had any close friends. Abby was my ride or die from the day we met. We were Beatrice and Abigail, Abby and B. We grew up together and our families became great friends. Abby was a second daughter to my parents. They hadn't been able to conceive a sibling for me. Her parents also treated me like family, so I was almost as devastated as Abby when her dad, Hank, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. It came out of the blue. One minute he was a larger-than-life personality, perhaps slightly overweight, but otherwise a picture of health. The next, he had months to live. I begged my dad to save him. I suggested we work together and share the darkness so it wouldn't overpower us, but Dad insisted it was too risky. He said Abby and Hank wouldn't want us to do it if they knew the consequences. I suggested telling them about our gift. I never understood why it had to be a secret, even from Mom. Obviously, I didn't want to shout it from the rooftops, but I didn't understand why we couldn't tell those closest to us. Dad said it was imperative that absolutely no one found out. He claimed it was possible for others to steal our power against our will. My dad was away on business when Hank took a turn for the worse. The doctor said he had days to live. My mom took me to Abby's house. She wanted to help cook for the extended family that had traveled to say goodbye. Abby was broken. I knew I had to do something before it was too late. I excused myself during dinner, pretending to need the bathroom. Hank was asleep and wired to machines when I crept into his room. I placed my palms over his forehead and saw the magical gold light for the second time in my 16 years. Hank was still unconscious when the light faded, so I thought it hadn't worked. He still looked heartbreakingly gaunt. I felt no darkness either, although with the cat it hadn't made itself known till the next day, so I knew that wasn't necessarily a point of reference. Even so, I returned to the dining table, feeling miserable. Five minutes later, Hank casually walked in, after a week of being unable to get out of bed. I was taken aback by how healthy he looked. He was very thin after nine months of illness, but his eyes and skin were bright. His elderly mother fainted in shock. Abby and her mom were frozen, tears pouring from their eyes. It was tears of joy all around that day. After tending to Abby's grandmother and calling the doctor, who initially thought Hank had gone into sudden and miraculous remission, we celebrated long into the night. I've never seen Abby so happy. Even as I felt the darkness creeping in, I knew I'd made the right choice. After extensive tests, Hank's tumor was found to have completely disappeared. Experts were amazed, saying it was impossible. His initial brain scans were scrutinized because doctors assumed there must have been some mistake with the diagnosis. Of course, they didn't find a mistake. His main doctor suspected his scans were muddled or deliberately swapped with someone else's. There was an internal investigation, but I don't think anything came of it. I had no energy the day after healing Hank. The world seemed like a cruel and dangerous place. I felt incredibly low and depressed. The most worrying part was the way my thoughts became increasingly manic. One night, I thought I had beaten Abby to death in her living room until I woke up in bed soaked with sweat. My knuckles were clean and unblemished, not bloody and swollen, like in the night terror. 
but it felt so real. I feared it was a premonition. I knew I had to get rid of the darkness. My dad was furious when he got home. He heard about Hank and knew what I had done. I've never seen him so angry. He could barely look at me. The next day, he took me to the hospital with Hank. Hank was going to visit a friend he made during his time on the oncology ward. His friend wasn't going to recover. The man was skin and bones, undoubtedly at heaven's door. My dad gave me a look as we were leaving. Once again, I feigned needing the bathroom. I went back to the hospital room. I told Hank's friend I was sorry before placing my hand on his arm to transfer the darkness. Like the rose, the man withered almost instantly. Somebody that sick couldn't withstand such dark energy. My dad must have suspected this. Technically, we're murderers. Dad said afterwards it had been the right thing to do for everyone involved, considering the man had hours to live before we came along. But it hurts to know I could have healed the man had I chosen to do so. Dad made me swear to never use my powers again. I promised and I truly meant it at the time. Years went by. I went to veterinary college with Abby. This is where we found our third musketeer, an aspiring zoologist called Felix. We were Abby, B, and Fee. We spent years in each other's pockets as we studied. After graduation, we went backpacking for three months to celebrate. The three of us had been inseparable throughout university, and whilst Abby and I were determined to continue living together, Felix had found a job across the country and would be moving away. We were on a coach in a mountainous region of Italy when our plans for the future crumbled to nothing. A truck plowed straight into us, sending the coach spinning out of control. I couldn't believe it was happening as we tipped over the cliff edge. People were thrown out of their seats and across the aisle. I could see the distant ground rising up to meet me through the window I was pressed against. I felt devastated for my parents as I imagined them hearing about my death, but the coach got caught on something. We hadn't quite tripped over, but we were teetering. Children cried, adults screamed and groaned in pain. Abby was beside me, but I couldn't see Felix. I called his name, but my voice was lost in the rising cacophony of panic. Abby looked dazed, but she was conscious. There was a cut above her left eyebrow, but she didn't seem seriously hurt. Neither did I after a quick inspection of myself. Then I saw Felix. He was helping a man break the windows on the other side of the coach, the side closest to the ground. There was nothing on my side but a sheer drop. People screamed as the bus lurched towards the abyss, but thankfully we didn't go over. A woman shrieked that she could smell gas. My heart thumped in terror when I realized she was right. Fee and the other man started yelling at people to climb out of the windows. They helped mothers out before passing them their children. More and more people got to safety as the stench of gasoline became overpowering. Soon there was nobody left on the coach but us and another group struggling to lift an unconscious friend to safety. He had a head injury and a broken arm. He was a big man, so even with Abby and me helping, we couldn't lift him high enough to get him through the window. The tilt of the coach made it impossible. Nobody else had been unconscious, so even if they were injured and needed help with the climb, they weren't completely helpless. This place is going to blow up or fall, Fee said urgently. We need to get out. We'll have to leave him, said the man that helped Fee break the windows. The woman beside me screamed that she wasn't leaving her brother. I knew what I had to do. The man gained consciousness about a minute after I healed him. The others gazed at me with a mix of fear and awe. The healed man and his friends escaped through one window while I helped Abby out the other. She looked down at me before leaping to the ground. You saved my dad, didn't you? I nodded. Her eyes filled with tears. Then someone yelled at her to get down and away from the coach. Fee tried to help me out the window Abby had just vacated, but I refused. I explained about the darkness as quickly as I could, desperate for him to get out before the coach became an inferno. You have to come with me, Fee begged. We can find another dying person to give this darkness thing to. I recalled the vision where I beat Abby to death. I couldn't take the risk. I could already feel the darkness corroding my very being. It seemed to get more aggressive every time I allowed it to infiltrate my soul. Felix grabbed my wrist, twisting it. I cried out in pain and tried to struggle free, but I couldn't. 
I remembered my dad saying it was possible for someone to steal our power, but it wasn't my power Fee was taking. It was the darkness. I begged him to put it back. Abby was screaming at us from outside the coach to hurry. The other man dragged her away. The smell of gas was worsening by the second. We were almost out of time. Go, Fee yelled at me. I thought again of my parents. I was their only child. I heaved myself through the window and sprinted the moment my feet hit the ground. Moments later, a wall of heat pushed me forward and threw me down. Then Abby's arms were around me. By the time the wind had cleared the smoke from the air, the coach had disappeared. The blast had sent it over the edge. I went into Abby's shoulder, unable to believe Felix was gone. I'm writing this account five years later. Part of me wishes I had kept my promise to my dad and hadn't healed anyone else. Then Fee would still be here. Another part wishes Fee stole my power as well as my darkness. I'm pregnant, so it could be passed to my child. My dad saw it as a curse. To me, it was a gift. Maybe I'm being wildly optimistic, but I hope my child will manage it better than we did. And to him or her, it can be a superpower. Whatever happens, I'll tell my child all about their Uncle Felix. He didn't need a gift to heal and save lives. My name is Nick. My life would have been pathetically unremarkable if not for one thing. I was born a werewolf. It's not like the movies. I wasn't bitten in the woods while camping with idiotic friends, and we don't turn into rabid dogs on the full moon, or go around biting the aforementioned idiotic campers. I've never heard of anyone getting turned by a bite or scratch. There's a rumor that's how the curse was spread at the dawn of time, but I don't remember ever caring. It's genetic, almost untraceable. Most medical treatments won't pick up on it, but we avoid in-depth examination of our DNA just in case. My cousin Sheldon is a werewolf too. Not everyone in the family got the gene. Aside from our late grandfather, it's just us. Sheldon knows one or two others online. Men seem more prone to the gene than women. Sheldon doesn't know any female werewolves, but apparently they exist. He says they're twice as powerful that he believes in any old rubbish he reads on the dark web. He also read that there are no more than a hundred of our kind in the whole world. But again, I don't recall caring. As I said, we don't turn into wolves on the full moon, or at all. Our powers are strongest around the full moon, but we can use them whenever we like. Most of our skills aren't that impressive. Slightly more body hair than the average person, sharper and faster growing nails that can protrude slightly when needed. Acute hearing, flawless eyesight, you'll never see one of our swearing glasses. We hew quicker than the average person, but not at a rate anyone would find alarming. My grandfather died at 108. He beat cancer three times without treatment, but unfortunately the fourth time was too aggressive, even for werewolf healing speed. That's the problem. We can recover from wounds that would be fatal to humans. But our bodies still need time to fight the disease or injury. This means we can be killed almost as easily as anyone else. An ordinary bullet does the job. No silver required. That pretty much sums up life as a werewolf. I suppose there's one more thing I should mention. I was 13 when I first experienced the most remarkable trait of our condition. Gramps didn't tell me about the werewolf gene until I was 15, so the experience was confusing as hell. I was walking down the school corridors with my mates. We were planning to ditch our lesson and go to the park instead. Lesson had already started, so we were the only ones about. Suddenly the corridor vanished, and I found myself in the toilets with Troy Parker in my face. He was this asshole a few years above me, and we did our best to stay out of his way. It was disgusting. I could almost taste the stale cigarettes on his breath. His spit hit my face when he called me a whore and said whores get what they deserve. I tried to move, but I couldn't feel my body. It was like I wasn't really there, sort of like a dream. Then I heard my friends repeating my name and I was back in the corridor. My mates were asking if I was ill, but I ignored them. 
the girls' toilets were just ahead of us on the right. On instinct, I went in. My mates followed, still asking what was going on. One was muttering that I had gone crazy and perhaps they shouldn't hang out with me anymore. Troy was in the toilet, pinning Roxanne Maxwell against the wall. It's lucky my mates were there because I couldn't have fought him off alone. He took off when we realised it was seven of us and Roxanne was terrified. At first, I thought it was because of Troy, but she was staring at me and looked at me like I was a freak. I didn't understand how. I knew she was there. My mate Rob thought it was a glitch in the matrix, whatever that means. A year later, I was walking back to Rob's place after a house party. It was gone midnight. It was the first time I had been drunk and high, and I abruptly found myself in an abandoned warehouse. There was yelling. A masked assailant rushed towards me with a machete, like something from a low-budget horror movie, and I braced myself for impact, but felt nothing. Then I was lying on the ground, Rob laughing as he drunkenly pulled me up. Like an idiot, I didn't associate this with the Roxanne incident, and assumed it was a combination of drugs and alcohol. I thought I had briefly passed out and had some kind of nightmare. The next day, the news reported that the body of a young man had been found in a disused warehouse about a mile from where I had been the night before. He had been fatally wounded by a large blade, possibly a machete. I couldn't have done anything. I was nearly a mile away and he was killed within 30 seconds of my vision. I couldn't have got there in the time even if I had realised what was going on. But I started to piece things together. It was like I could see through the eyes of victims when they needed help most. They call, and I come. I thought I was psychic, until Gramps sat us down and told us about the werewolf gene. Sheldon had a hard time believing him. For months he thought Gramps had gone senile, and I believed it instantly. I told Gramps about Roxanne and the murdered man, and he said something similar had happened to him. He was once able to save a child from drowning. Sheldon finally accepted the truth when it happened to him. His friend Bex thought some guy was following her. Turns out the man was just walking in the same direction. Bex is always hanging around Sheldon like a fly to a carcass. She's probably in love with him, but he's gay. Anyway, I had a few more visions over the years. Sometimes I could help, sometimes not. It never happened outside of a one mile radius or in a non-emergency situation. It was 2.30 at night when this happened. Sheldon persuaded me to go to Bex's cousin's friend's neighbor's party. I didn't want to go because it was in the city and we had to catch three trains to get out of our dead end town. None of us wanting to forfeit a free bar to be designated driver. We were too broke to get a taxi. The party sucked. We didn't know anyone and it turned out to be bring your own bottle. Should have figured Bex didn't know her cousin's neighbor that well. The alleged free bar had been Chinese whispers. So we were pretty much sober and Shoulder ran to the nearest off license. But as I said, we were broke. Werewolves also have a higher alcohol tolerance than humans. We need to drink a lot to get drunk. We left just after 11 feeling deflated. And at that time of night, there was 40 minutes to wait for our last train. I needed to slash after Sheldon's cheap booze. The small train station didn't have any restrooms, so I decided to wander over to the public toilets a five minute walk away. The streets were almost deserted. The town next to ours on the train line is equally run down. The public restrooms were unlocked. Hell, there wasn't even a door. So I went inside. I did my business and left the grimy restroom. That's when they jumped me. I was smacked round the head with something the moment I stepped back into the night. They must have been waiting, pressed against the wall. My nails jutted out, but I couldn't get a clear strike at my assailants. It's hard to aim when your vision is like a fairground ride. I was dragged back into the restroom. I hoped a passing Samaritan would help me, but there were no shops open, no nightlife and no reason at all for anyone to be out. There were at least three of them. I heard voices, all with a distinct accent, Australian, Russian, German. We lived in an incredibly unremarkable industrial area. 
it's the kind of place people dream of leaving. There's next to no tourism, and I found it odd that three men of different nationalities would visit the same area at the same time, let alone together. My vision settled a little, I noticed that they were wearing socks with no shoes, probably so I wouldn't hear them following me. I kicked myself because I would have noticed if I'd have been paying more attention to my surroundings, shoes or no shoes. I couldn't make out everything they were saying, because I was drifting in and out of consciousness, but the German boy called me wolf boy and I went numb with panic when I realised they knew. I wondered if Sheldon's excursions on the dark web led them to us. A blade tore my body open from neck to navel. The cut wasn't deep enough to kill, but painful enough to make me cry in agony. I knew the wound wasn't fatal, but I couldn't fight or stand. If I made any attempts, they kicked me down, aggravating the wound in the process. In that moment, I regretted never taking any self-defense classes. I guess I always assumed being a werewolf would be enough, as insignificant as the condition often felt. I must have stayed this way for 10 minutes. The Australian was asking why the other one hadn't turned up yet, and I realised the other one meant Sheldon. Then I figured it out. They thought I would call Sheldon the same way Roxanne Maxwell called me all those years ago. I laughed. I laughed so hard the wound on my chest became unbearably painful. The German barked at me demanding to know what was up. I told them I'd never bring Sheldon here, and I told them one has to desperately want to be found for it to work, and Sheldon coming here was the last thing I wanted. The blade sank into my stomach, my mouth filled with metallic blood, and I felt the warm liquid run down my chin and onto my chest. The men left the restroom saying they would try to get Sheldon on the platform or the train without anyone seeing. One said they should have gone to our houses, but another said the neighbours would have noticed or heard. And after the footsteps faded, I used my own blood to write on my arm. It said, run, don't go home. I held my arm in front of my face and focused on the words. Then I let Sheldon see. I could feel him in my head. It was a strange sensation, almost alien. This must have been why Roxanne was so frightened. She felt me invade her mind and see through her eyes. Sheldon stayed until the darkness claimed me. Ask her out already, my friend Rory said, snapping his fingers in front of my face. I hadn't realised I was staring. We always went to that coffee shop because Shelby worked there. I'd had a crush on her since school. At the age of 18, living our lives as working adults, nothing had changed. I can't exactly say Shelby was a friend of mine, but we talked at events and parties over the years. Sometimes, in those conversations, I felt like we connected. There were moments when it seemed like she knew me better than Rory. Everything is surface level with him. He never takes life seriously. So, Rory said. So what, I replied, bringing my thoughts back to the present. Are you gonna ask her out? I can't, I sighed. I couldn't risk being rejected. The pity in her eyes as she tried to let me down gently, it was a truly horrifying thought. I'll go and ask if she likes you, Rory said, standing up. I grabbed his arm and shouted, no! It must have been louder than I intended, because other customers paused their conversations to look over. Glance at Shelby confirmed she was busy at the counter and thankfully unaware anything was amiss in the seating area. Are you crazy? I whispered as Rory sat back down. Before he could reply, the stranger at the table next to us leaned over. Excuse me for interrupting, he said. I couldn't help but overhear. I might have a solution to your problem. I wasn't interested in the stranger's interjection, but I was too polite to tell him to butt out. Something about him gave me the creeps. He wasn't bad looking, but I doubted a girl like Shelby would find him attractive. His features were too angular, too sharp somehow. 
I was about to suggest to Rory that we leave, but he started conversing with the stranger, asking what he had in mind. I'm known as a matchmaker, the stranger told us. Let's just say you can call me Cupid. He mined firing a bow and arrow at Shelby's heart. Luckily, she didn't notice. At this point, I really wanted to get out of there. Let me tell you how it works, the stranger continued. There are three stages to my powers. You can pick one, two, or all three, but you must pick at the start. You can't choose one initially, then ask for more later. Number one, I get you a date with the lovely Shelby. She will agree to go out with you and the evening will run smoothly. But I warn you, I don't do this out of the goodness of my heart. The day after the date, I will phone you and set a challenge. Of course, you can refuse to do the challenge, but there'll be consequences. This very cafe will crumble to the ground. I glanced at Rory. He circled his finger round his ear and mouthed the word crazy. The stranger didn't seem perturbed and kept talking. Number two, Shelby will agree to a second date. This date will end in sex. Again, there will be a challenge and a forfeit if you fail. This time, one of your friends or family members will lose an arm. Rory looked disturbed and went to say something. I held up my hand to silence him. For some reason, I wanted to hear what the stranger, Cupid, would say next. Finally, I can have Shelby fall head over heels in love. She'll marry you, have your babies, the full works. The final challenge will be the most difficult and failure the most costly. The whole town will be ravaged by a hurricane. <laughs> Hurricanes never happen here, Rory laughed. I can arrange for one, Cupid said seriously. I realise this must be an elaborate joke set up by Rory. He has a huge family with lots of cousins I've never met. He had enlisted their help before. I felt disappointed in myself for not catching on sooner. Very funny, I told Rory. I turned to Cupid. Go on then, the full works, I'll take all three. It was a pleasure doing business with you. I'll be in touch. He shook my hand and then departed, leaving his coffee and doughnut untouched on the table. Now we know he's full of it, Rory said. He didn't ask for your number. How's he going to call you? He doesn't know our names or anything. Wasn't it one of your cousins? I asked. Rory said it wasn't. He looked truthful. He's got a good poker face when a prank is happening, but tends to lose it once caught out. As we were leaving, I begged Rory to tell me if he was responsible. He said again he wasn't, and again I believed him. He must have been messing with us, Rory said, or maybe he escaped the psych ward. Just let me check something. Before I could stop him, he ran over to Shelby and asked her if she'd go on a date with me. To my surprise, she said yes. I was creeped out at first, but soon decided it was a coincidence. I'd known Shelby for years and often felt a spark on the few occasions we were alone together. It wasn't that implausible she could return my feelings. I took her out for dinner the next evening. The conversation flowed without awkward pauses and the connection and mutual understanding I've always felt with her intensified. We said goodnight and arranged to go out again the next day. I'd forgotten about Cupid when the phone rang. My blood chilled when I heard his voice. I trust you enjoyed your date, he drawled. How, how did you get this number? I stuttered. You needn't concern yourself with that. Your first challenge is to cut someone in public. I suggest a pocket knife and the crowd that queues outside the nightclub. You needn't seriously harm your mark. Drawing blood will be enough. 
I'll settle for torn clothing if they were wearing several layers and you couldn't have known. You have until daybreak. This is ridiculous, I said, almost yelling. My date with Shelby had nothing to do with you. How would you even know if I do your stupid challenge? I waited for an answer before realising he had hung up. I phoned Rory and explained what happened. What if he's following me? I asked, paranoia creeping in. It's the only way he could have known I went out with Shelby tonight. He must have known my full name before he approached us at the cafe. How else could he look up my number? He's just some freak, Rory replied, seemingly unconcerned. There are loads of ways he could have got your name and number. Maybe he works with the plumbers that fixed the John last week. Just forget about him. Talking to Rory put me at ease and I went to bed. After checking the doors and windows were locked. The next day, on my way to work, I saw a crowd ahead. I picked up my pace to see what was going on. People were stood outside the cafe, or what had been the cafe. The roof had collapsed, debris destroying the whole establishment. The proprietor, Mr. Jones, was stood in front of the wreckage, looking devastated. I pushed through the crowd to reach him. What happened? I asked. In my heart, I already knew. Cupid was behind this. I never thought he would destroy someone's livelihood for the sake of some sick prank. Some customers noticed the ceiling was damp in the restrooms, Mr. Jones replied. I should have listened and called in the experts. He sounded distraught. I told him I was sorry and continued walking to work. It made sense now. Cupid must have been one of the customers aware of the damp problem. I suspected he had somehow aggravated the damaged ceiling to coincide the cafe's collapse with my challenge. I knew I'd have to tread carefully. He was obviously unhinged and possibly stalking me. I briefly wondered if I should go to the police, but I didn't think they'd believe me. I worried they'd suspect I was the one that vandalised the cafe. I contemplated cancelling my second date with Shelby, but I wasn't prepared to sacrifice my future with her because of this psycho. Cupid said the second date would end in sex, so I decided to err on the side of caution and not sleep with her until the third date. That way, when Cupid called, I could say he hadn't fulfilled his side of the bargain. Unfortunately, it's not that easy when the woman of your dreams is intent on getting intimate with you. The day ended exactly as Cupid promised. I contemplated not answering the phone, but I was too curious. Shame about the cafe, Cupid chuckled. What do you want? I snapped. Simply to give you the second challenge. It's quite controlling, isn't it? Having a girl fall for you against her will because it's what you want. With that in mind, your second challenge is to carve the word sadist onto your forehead, deep enough to scar. You have until daybreak. You're crazy, I told him. But again, he had already hung up. I called Rory. He came over so we could discuss it. He's obviously off his rocker, but what's he going to do? You're not actually thinking of disfiguring yourself, are you? He asked me. I don't know. Do you remember what the second forfeit was? I replied. One of your friends or family losing an arm, Rory reminded me. <sighs> he couldn't have picked one of your enemies, huh? Rory laughed, but my blood ran cold. He could actually hurt someone if I don't do this, I said. He won't, Rory assured me. The cafe could have been a coincidence, and even if it wasn't, there's a huge difference between that and attacking someone. They'll be able to identify him for one thing, or they might kill him in self-defense. And losing an arm isn't that bad, as long as it's not mine. I decided Rory was right. Surely Cupid wouldn't risk prison, but I was too on edge to sleep. I was still awake at 6 a.m. when the phone rang. I half expected Cupid, but it was my mum. 
It's been an accident, she told me, her voice choked with tears. It's your sister. She's going to be okay, but they had to amputate her arm. I rushed to the hospital. I learnt that my sister had been in a car crash. Someone stepped out into the road. She swerved to avoid hitting them and lost control of the car. It flipped a few times before colliding with a tree. The impact crushed her right arm. Of course, I knew the identity of the person in the road. My sister should have run him down. But I soon realised it didn't add up. It was the surgeons that amputated my sister's arm, not Cupid. He could have caused her to swerve, but how could he control the way the car collided with the tree? It bothered me as the weeks and months went on. Things were going great with Shelby. Our relationship became more serious. She helped cook and clean for my sister after she was discharged from hospital. My unease grew after I bumped into Mr Jones at the supermarket. He told me the fire department had determined that damp wasn't the cause of the cafe's collapse. Strangely, they were unable to identify any cause at all. It was down as unknown on the insurance form. Later that day, the phone rang. The shivers running through my body told me it was Cupid before I picked up. Time for your third and final challenge, he said. This one is the most difficult and the consequences for failure most severe. Now you and Shelby are love's young dream, you must be able to empathise with less fortunate lovers. Imagine how broken you'd be if Shelby betrayed you. Mr Mason down the road is cheating on his wife. Your final task is to punish him for his crimes. You have until daybreak to kill him. As usual, I called Rory right away. I told him about Cupid's call and how I'd have to do the challenge this time. I couldn't allow a hurricane to destroy the town. Thousands of families would lose their homes. Parents would lose children. Children would be orphaned. And there was my own family and friends to consider. What about Shelby? Would she be injured or killed in Cupid's sick scheme? My sister had already been through enough. I considered telling them to go away for the weekend, but that wouldn't help the other 50,000 members of the town's population. You're as nuts as he is, Rory snapped, his voice harsher than I'd heard it in the 10 years I'd known him. He could have wrecked the cafe and caused your sister's crash, but how the hell can he make a hurricane? He's one man for crying out loud. He's playing mind games and you're smart enough to know better. If you do this, you're not the person I thought you were. I was worried Rory would refuse to leave so he could keep an eye on me, but he went home in a temper. I wanted to believe he was right, that I was crazy to consider taking Mr Mason's life, but I knew this was wishful thinking. From the strange circumstances of the cafe's collapse and my sister's accident, to Cupid mysteriously knowing my name and number, right down to him not eating his donut that day in the cafe, I knew he wasn't human. If he wanted to conjure a hurricane, he would. I unintentionally knew Mr Mason's routine. I usually saw him running in the park while I was walking home from work. The park was quiet when I hid among the greenery, gripping a hammer in my hand. A few joggers and dawdling teenagers passed while I waited for Mr Mason. Plan B was to kill him in his house or on his doorstep, but it would have been near impossible without his wife or a neighbour seeing me. As luck or twisted fate had it, there was nobody else in sight when I saw Mr Mason approaching. I stepped out a split second after he passed me and caved his skull in with the hammer. His legs buckled and he fell to the ground like a rag doll. I felt sick as his blood leaked onto the concrete. I managed to refrain from vomiting. I couldn't afford to leave my DNA at the scene, although I had come to terms with going to prison. If it saved thousands of lives, it was a price I had to pay. I had expected the police to knock on my door. My heart almost raced out my chest when they did, 
until I realised they were just going door to door, asking if anyone had noticed anything unusual or knew why someone would want to harm Mr. Mason. I assured them I knew nothing. The guilt was overwhelming. I think it would have killed me if not for my resolve that I did the wrong thing for the right reasons. I didn't hear anything from Cupid or Rory. I thought he would tell the police I was responsible for Mr. Mason's death. He didn't, but he never forgave me either. I moved away after meeting my wife, Sandra. That's right, it turned out what I felt for Shelby was puppy love. Unfortunately, she feels for me the all-consuming love I feel for Sandra. She took the breakup hard. I didn't cheat on her. I met Sandra six months after ending things with Shelby. But to this day, Shelby still makes advances on a daily basis. I'm very fortunate that Sandra believed me about Cupid and tolerates Shelby. Otherwise, we wouldn't have our four wonderful kids. We moved across the country three times to get away from Shelby, but she always found us after a few months. In the end, my youngest suggested we embrace Shelby as a sort of weird aunt, because she's still a kind person, despite her infatuation with me. She pretty much lives with us now. She has her own place, but getting her to go there is a challenge, to say the least. I feel awful that it's my fault she'll never experience the kind of relationship I have with Sandra. We tried to find a way to reverse Cupid's curse online, but all the suggestions were either unsafe or didn't work. We've hidden five different herb concoctions in her food at this point. I'm not convinced any of the bloggers I found online met the same Cupid. As life went on and my kids grew up, my eldest is now expecting a child of her own, I was never able to stop the niggling doubts. I couldn't help wondering if Rory was right and I'd taken a man's life for nothing. These doubts ended yesterday. I saw Cupid. He hadn't aged a day, despite our meeting in the cafe being 30 years ago. I thought he might not recognize me, but he smiled. You could always dispose of Shelby the same way you did poor Mr. Mason, he said nonchalantly. Who are you? I asked. He smirked for a long time before replying. I can't tell you that. I'll only say this. There are thousands of supernatural beings in the universe, but very few walk on Earth. Most of those that do are angels or demons. You're a pizza delivery guy. It isn't your dream job, but you don't hate the work. It's a tolerable way to pay the rent until you figure out what to do with your life. Your boss is what you call a stand-up guy. After the recent news reports about fast food delivery workers getting attacked and mugged, he insisted all staff members work in pairs when delivering to isolated or rundown areas. Other takeout restaurants only care about the bottom line, and the safety of their employees comes second. Your boss isn't like that, so you feel safe when the order comes through for two large margaritas to be delivered to a house out in the sticks. You and Lois can go together. You get on well with Lois. You're not exactly friends, but you always have a laugh at work. And you occasionally see her in a social capacity because she's close with your girlfriend, Amanda. It takes half an hour to get to the house. You hope the pizzas are still warm. They're in a storage bag, designed to retain heat, but most deliveries are made in 15 minutes or less, so you're slightly concerned. The pizzas are the least of your worries when your headlights reveal the dilapidated state of the house. It looks abandoned with wooden panels sealing several broken windows. Graffiti artists have made their mark on the wall beside the front door. Despite all this, you can't assume that nobody lives here. You have to at least try the doorbell, 
It's your job. Your boss is cool, but not that cool. You don't want the cost of undelivered pizzas taken out of your wages. Lois looks apprehensive. You assure her, it'll be okay, before you both get out of the car and take tentative steps towards the isolated house. The porch creaks under your boots. The night air is scented with rain and pine needles. Something off to the side catches your eye. There's a splatter of a dark substance up the wall. You're straining to see in the moonlight, wondering if it's blood, when Lois gasps. You follow her frightened gaze to an ominous figure lurking in the darkness. He, or maybe it's a she, is wearing a black ankle-length hooded cloak. You wonder if this is a prank set up by your co-workers back at the shop. This isn't the attire of the average mugger. Lois grips your arm and points to a second cloaked figure emerging from the dark. You spot a third and a fourth, a fifth and a sixth. Lois's nails dig further into your flesh. The figures stride swiftly towards you, approaching from all directions. They're between you and the car. You doubt you'll be able to get past them to reach your vehicle. Lois is making panicked noises. You know you have to take charge. You ask Lois where her phone is. She says she left it in the car. You pat your pockets and realize you've made the same mistake. It had been low in battery, so you plugged it into the USB charging point. It's still there now, so close yet utterly useless. You smash the nearest window. The glass easily falls from its rotten frame with a clatter that shatters the night. You lift Lois to help her through before climbing in yourself. The house is empty and filthy, clearly abandoned. You plan to find the back door and escape that way. But when you reach the rear of the property, you see more figures coming towards the house from that direction. You take Lois's hand and lead her back towards the front door. You'll have to make a dash for the car and hope to get between the figures. But one of them is climbing through the broken window when you get there. You pull Lois up the stairs and lock yourself in the bathroom. The lock is flimsy and won't hold under pressure. But it gives you time to catch your breath. Your heart is beating hard and your limbs are shaking. Lois is white in the grim darkness. What do we do? She gasps. There isn't any furniture you can use to barricade the door. Lois screams when somebody crashes against the door from the other side. The lock holds. You sit down with your back against the door, so you're barricading it with your body, and Lois follows suit. This seems like a good idea until a machete penetrates the door inches above your head. Lois screams again. None of this feels real. You run over to the window, wondering if you can jump but it's too far down, and there aren't any footholds. The machete punches through the door again. On impulse, you release the lock and swing the door open. Your assailant is still holding the handle of the machete and comes stumbling towards you. He didn't expect the door to open and you didn't expect to snap his neck without a moment's thought, but you do. Your uncle taught you how when he needed to put animals on his farm out of their misery. You strip the assailant of his cloak. He's naked underneath, but you barely notice this. You're too shocked by the intricate tattoos that pattern his entire face and shaved head. His mouth gapes open and you're alarmed to see he has no teeth or tongue. You shove the cloak at Lois, telling her to put it on. You know there won't be much time before another figure appears. You can hear creaky footsteps in the adjacent room. Thankfully, the hood of the cloak is huge and covers Lois's blonde ponytail. With whispered urgency, you tell her to leave, posing as one of them. You're confident it will fool them long enough to get her a clear run at the car. You give her your keys and tell her to drive a short distance away, then call the cops. You pull out the bath panel after noticing it isn't sealed in place. 
You crawl inside and ask Lois to replace the panel before she goes. There isn't much space and your body prevents the panel sliding perfectly back into place. But Lois says it conceals you. She assures you she'll get help and is doing this for Amanda. She seems to emphasize that part. You listen to her footsteps as she leaves, until you can hear them no more. A minute or two later, a car engine starts up, hopefully yours. Multiple footsteps rush towards the front door. This makes you certain the car is yours with Lois at the wheel. Tires crunch across gravel, hopefully taking Lois to safety. Some of the figures are still moving through the house. You hope they think you're with Lois and didn't see she was alone. You think maybe they will leave, but they don't. Two people enter the bathroom, inches from your hiding place. You can see their legs through the slight gap between the bath and the panel. There are no cries of alarm at the sight of their fallen comrade's body and no expressions of grief. They bend down and drag him across the floor and out of the room. Time passes and help doesn't come. You're sure the cops should be here by now. Your watch tells you 20 minutes have passed. That should have been enough time because police don't need to stop for traffic or red lights. Lois's words come back to you and a horrific thought sets your heart racing. She said she was doing this for Amanda. Your mind replays the strange way she puts emphasis on that point. Did Amanda tell her about the cheating? She swore she hadn't told anyone about you and Tiffany because she was too embarrassed. She later promised she wouldn't because you're trying to work things out and other people hating you won't help. But what if she lied? You dismiss the idea, inwardly laughing at yourself. Lois has been friendly with you since Amanda discovered your infidelity. And even if Amanda did tell her, Lois wouldn't leave you to die. You're certain of this. Until help doesn't arrive. The figures find you and pull you from your hiding spot. There are four of them. You get one with a strong right hook, but the others soon restrain you. As they drag you from the room, you get a glimpse out the window. Your car is gone. Lois escaped and left you to rot. The pain that follows is a blur. You're in and out of consciousness when they beat you senseless and shave your head and scratch your face with what feels like some kind of a blade. You pass out when they cut your tongue and then pull your teeth out one by one with pliers. If you knew such pain existed, you never imagined it would happen to you. A few of them chant in an unfamiliar language. You assume the chanters still have their teeth and tongues, but you're in too much agony to care. You think you're going to die. You silently plead for death. But, like the help you waited for so recently, yet so long ago, death doesn't turn up. They keep you chained in a house, not unlike the one where you'd been delivering pizza. They feed you broth and beat you when you don't worship Satan correctly, according to their rules and regulations. You have no idea how long you've been there. It could be weeks or months. You don't know if it's night or day. But then everything changes and you're pleased to find it's the darkest kind of night outside. It makes your fire all the brighter. You love watching that house in flames. You relish the scent of burning flesh and their cries of terror. The very chains that bound you are holding your enemies now. Well, all but one. You climb up the fire escape and through an open window. Lois is in her kitchen. She jumps when she notices an intruder, but otherwise doesn't look that shocked to find a cloaked figure in her apartment. She is shocked when you pull down your hood and she sees it's you. The realization takes her a few seconds. You're thinner than when she last saw you, 
not to mention the scars now etched on your once unblemished skin. She tries to run but you easily catch her and smash her face against the kitchen counter. You hear her nose explode. She's still conscious when you strangle her to death. This makes you happy, although you don't experience joy in the way you used to. Elation might be a better word for how you feel when Lois struggles until she can fight no more. You leave her body on the kitchen tiles. Amanda smiles at you from a photograph pinned to the fridge with a magnet. But all you feel is disassociation. You catch your reflection in the hallway mirror on the way out. It's a surreal experience. Your eyes are staring back at you, but the person behind them is no more familiar than the tattoos on your face. We are two strangers facing each other at a metaphorical crossroads. I'm not sure if you realize this is where your story ends and mine begins. Sometimes I wish I wasn't the first person in my family to go to college and that I would have been content to just join my parents and cousins in the family bakery. Then the events of this story wouldn't have happened. I had an interview for a place at an art college. The college in question was my second choice, but I was still excited. It was my first interview, my first time driving outside my tiny hometown since getting my driver's license, and my sister Lucy and best friend Jamie were coming along for the ride. We'd been looking forward to the trip for weeks. It was a nine hour drive, so we left early the day before the interview. We had booked a hotel near the college to stay overnight. The route was mostly on the interstate, so I expected to make good time. And we did, for the first six hours. Then the radio warned us an overturned truck was causing delays ahead. Lucy googled it on her phone. There's been an oil leak and it's gridlocked, she told us. I hope everyone's okay, Jamie said from the back seat. Lucy said, the truck driver was sent to the hospital with minor injuries. Luckily, no one else was hurt. I asked, does it say when things will get moving again? She replied, no, but the leak looks serious and they'll have to move the truck. It says major delays are to be expected and not to travel if possible. I groaned in frustration. I did not want to be tired for my interview. It had already been a long day of driving. I knew I'd be exhausted the next day if we arrived at our hotel late at night. I pulled over onto the shoulder and studied the sat-nav on my phone, searching for an alternative route. We were 20 minutes from the affected stretch of the road. I thought perhaps we could get around it and rejoin the interstate on the other side. I found a route. It was long-winded, and some of the roads looked pretty rural. I knew it would add at least an hour to our journey, but I figured it was better than sitting in traffic indefinitely, so I left the interstate at the next exit. At first it went smoothly and we were in high spirits. Lucy was munching on pretzels and Jamie was singing along to the radio, but as we ventured further into the countryside, I realized the road I planned to take was a footpath, not wide enough for a car. This hadn't been obvious on the map. I did a U-turn, hoping there was another way. I drove around but didn't find one. It was getting dark. The girls were silent, concern growing. Let's just get back to the interstate, Jamie suggested. I put the interstate into the sat-nav, but it lost connection. My cheap car didn't have a built-in sat-nav. I was using my phone, which needed some kind of internet connection to plan a route. I tried to find my way back to the interstate without the sat-nav's help, but it was hopeless. I thought my phone would eventually pick up a connection, but it didn't. This made me certain we were headed in the wrong direction, but every time I turned around or tried a different road, we got more lost. It was soon pitch black, my headlights the only illumination in the wilderness. The others looked nervous. Lucy blurted, we need to call 911. Jamie laughed, way to overreact, she chuckled. We need to call someone, I said, planning to call my dad. But there was no signal, of course. My phone soon ran out of battery, so did Lucy's. Hers didn't have much to begin with, and the sat-nav had drained mine. Jamie's was still going, but she had no signal to call anyone. I noticed the car was getting low on fuel. I didn't tell the others because I didn't want to alarm them. My car was also struggling on the potholed roads, and I feared we'd get a puncture. Then we saw lights ahead. It was a building. Jamie whooped with joy. Lucy had tears in her eyes. I drove towards it, soon realizing it was a motel. It was nearly 10 p.m. We decided we'd have to stay here tonight and lose our money on the hotel we booked. 
I was exhausted, and it would be easier to find our way back to the interstate in daylight. There were 11 other vehicles in the car park. I was surprised a motel this far out back and beyond would have so many visitors. I hoped it wasn't some posh retreat we couldn't afford, otherwise we'd be sleeping in the car. I figured at least we'd found somewhere to ask directions. The motel turned out to be very reasonably priced. The decor in the office was strikingly old-fashioned. Jamie muttered something about Bates Motel. I cringed, hoping the elderly woman behind the front desk hadn't heard. She introduced herself as Mrs. Morris. She was keen to help and kindly gave me a bottle of fuel for my car, but she didn't seem to know what a sat-nav was when I explained our predicament. She also claimed there wasn't an interstate nearby. This panicked me. I worried with all the wrong turns we might be wildly off course. But Mrs. Morris looked to be in her 70s or 80s. I wondered if she was confused because you would expect a local motel owner to be aware of the interstate. The motel didn't offer rooms with enough beds for three people, so we took two rooms with Lucy and I sharing a bed and Jamie in her own room. There was an inside door connecting our rooms. This could be locked if the people in the next room were strangers, but we kept it unlocked for Jamie. We said goodnight and I hurried to get ready for bed as we planned to leave early the next day. I plugged my phone into charge and was about to turn out the lights when Jamie came running through the connecting door. She had a towel around her body and shampoo in her hair. What's wrong? She asked urgently. I was in the shower. Confused, I asked what she was talking about. You were hammering on my door screaming, she replied. I glanced at Lucy in confusion. I said, why would I knock when the door's unlocked? It was the outside door, Jamie replied. I could see her piecing it together. It couldn't have been me. I wouldn't have gone to the outside door when I could use the connecting door. I was sure it was you, Jamie added. I glanced at Lucy again. It didn't make sense. Neither of us had left our room. With our room being adjacent to Jamie's, we would have heard if someone had been at her door, especially if they were screaming. I looked at Jamie expecting her to announce it was a joke, but she looked confused and borderline terrified. It's probably nothing to worry about, I said, trying to reassure her. I wondered if this really was Bates Motel, but kept the thought to myself. Double check the outside door is locked, I added, then whoever was out there can't get in. Lucy went to the bathroom, but before she closed the door, she ran back out shrieking. Jamie and I asked what was wrong in unison. There was an old woman at the window. Was it Mrs. Morris, I asked? She wasn't that old, Lucy replied before she and Jamie started getting hysterical. I went to the bathroom after calming them down. I feared if they kept screaming, Mrs. Morris would ask us to leave and we had nowhere else to go. The only window was tiny and high up. Nobody was there now. I wasn't worried. There were bars on the outside to prevent entry and most people wouldn't fit through such a small window anyway. There was no window in the bedroom. I thought this was a bit odd, but it didn't really matter. If anything, it made it harder for intruders to break in. I did my best to convince the others that nobody could get into our rooms and we should go to bed. I was exhausted. I'm really hungry, Lucy moaned. There was little I could do. There was no room service and we had no snacks left. I suggested we just get some sleep to pass the time until we could get food in the morning. My sleep was fitful because Lucy's tossing and turning kept waking me. At 5.30 a.m., she said she couldn't sleep and asked if we could get food. So I showered, hoping the breakfast hall would be open by the time I was done. It turned out there wasn't a breakfast hall, but Mrs. Morris drew us a map to the nearest diner. She said her friend Gus's omelets were sublime and to tell him she sent us. It took 20 minutes to drive to the diner. It was busier than I would have expected given the hour, but there were trucks outside, so I assumed most of the customers were delivery drivers. That's odd, Lucy said, pointing to a display on the wall. There was a memorial for Gus, the original owner of the place. This confirmed my suspicion that Mrs. Morris wasn't all there. After enjoying a delicious cooked breakfast, omelets were not on the menu, we returned to the car, planning to check out of the motel and collect our belongings before going on our way. My interview was at noon. We would be cutting it fine. I'm sure you can understand my frustration when we got lost. It didn't make any sense. I was sure of the way back to the motel. We had Mrs. Morris's map and I had no issues on the way to the diner. There was an overgrown plot of grass where I expected the motel to be. I drove through the country lanes searching for the motel before somehow ending up back at the diner. I went in to ask for directions, feeling deflated, knowing I'd almost certainly miss my interview. The waitress gave me a knowing smile when I asked how to get to the motel. So, it happened to you too, she said. I looked at her in confusion, just wanting the directions. This happens from time to time, she explained. 
People see the old motel, one customer even swore he stayed there. He seemed perfectly sane, that was the weird part. The motel burned to the ground 30 years ago. There was a gas explosion. Luckily, the staff hadn't arrived yet, but the owner, Marjorie, and 15 guests died. What was Marjorie's last name? I asked, my voice and hands shaking. Morris, an old man at the counter replied. Lovely woman, the place burnt down 30 years ago today, in fact, around 6.45 a.m. Plans for the new section of the interstate were announced shortly after, so it was never rebuilt. The land wouldn't be good for anything commercial. Nobody ever drives through there unless they're lost. It's a funny old tale what happened to my brother-in-law. He survived that night after some crazy lady told him he'd die if he stayed. Saved his life, it did. He still feels guilty for not warning everyone else, but he didn't take the woman seriously. Only he couldn't sleep after running into her, so he packed up and left. I felt like the floor was going to drop out from under me. I gripped the counter for stability, my breath coming in gasps. The waitress guided me to a booth. It's all right, honey, she said. It's sad, but it was 30 years ago. They're at peace now. You don't understand, I told her through heavy breaths. Jamie's still inside. We drove back to the empty plot where the motel used to be. Having confirmed with the waitress this was the right place, we shouldn't have gone to breakfast without Jamie. It was early and she was asleep. I didn't want to disturb her. Lucy was able to get a weak 3G connection on her phone. There had been none yesterday. I laughed, realizing 3G didn't exist 30 years ago. My laughter gave way to gut-wrenching sobs. Lucy held my hand as I cried. Internet searches confirmed what the people in the diner told us. The old motel was gone. I was desperate to know how Jamie died. Did she fade like a ghost or did she experience the explosion? Did she die quickly or was she trapped in the flames? Then something occurred to me. If the motel were to appear again, would Jamie still be alive? Could I get her out? I rented a small cottage nearby but hardly spent any time there. I'd sit in my car entire days and nights waiting for the motel to appear. It never did, not even on the anniversary of the explosion. Lucy eventually persuaded me to move on with my life. I finally went to college, having deferred for two years. But I always returned to the site of the motel on the anniversary of the explosion, hoping against hope it would reappear. Last year, it did. I sprinted from my car to Jamie's room, banging on the door, screaming her name. Nobody answered. I remembered Jamie saying she was in the shower, so I ran around the back of the motel. I stood on a bin to call through what I thought was Jamie's bathroom window, but I must have miscalculated. It was our room. Lucy looked up at me and ran from the room, shrieking. It was surreal seeing my sister 15 years younger than she is now. I called to Lucy, to Jamie, to myself, screaming until my throat was sore, but nobody heard me. I sensed the motel was somehow diminishing my voice. The suspicion was confirmed when I ran back to the front of the motel and tried to bang on the door of the room I shared with Lucy. A force pushed me away, like the door and myself were two magnets repelling. A man called out, asking if I was alright. I must have looked insane, trying to knock and being pushed away by an invisible force. Leave, I screamed at him. You'll die if you stay here. I wanted to smash a window, but the rooms had none. I remembered there was an axe in my car, so I sprinted to get it. I could use it to break Jamie's door down. No invisible force had stopped me reaching her door. Once Jamie was safely out, I'd tell Mrs. Morris to evacuate the motel. I realized I should have done this in the first place. She probably had master keys to all the rooms. I decided to abandon the axe idea and go to the front desk, but when I turned away from my car, the motel was gone. All the cars but my own, gone. The man, gone. I screamed, falling to my knees. I had one chance to save my best friend and I'd failed her, like I failed her by leaving her alone in the first place. The motel must have vanished when I had my back to it on the way to the car. When we arrived all those years ago, I guess at least one of us must have had it in our field of vision at all times. I wondered if something demonic was at work, but my husband thinks the motel is a ghost of the past or a glitch in time. He has a theory that it would be catastrophic for a future and past self to meet, so the universe does everything in its power to stop this from happening. He thinks that's why I was repelled from getting to my own room, but not Jamie or the man. There's so much I could have tried but didn't. Why didn't I leave a note on my past self's car? Why didn't I warn Mrs. Morris the moment the motel reappeared? 
I'm yet to get a chance to right these wrongs. The motel hasn't appeared again, but I can promise you this. If it shows itself again in my lifetime, I'm going to save my best friend. Everyone is looking at Mrs. Craddock when she tells us Tommy Fletcher died last night. Except me. I'm looking at Tommy Fletcher. He's standing to the right of Mrs. Craddock at the front of the assembly hall. He's staring at me. He doesn't blink. My eyes dart around the hall. Nobody else seems to see him. My heart is beating fast and my throat is dry, but I'm not scared exactly. Okay, maybe I am scared, but I'm not terrified. Is he a ghost? I thought ghosts were meant to be white and floating in midair. Tommy looks exactly like he did last week, except paler. He also blinked last week and never stared at me. He wasn't dead last week. He stands across the room in science class. He never moves or looks away from me. I can't talk to him because all my classmates are here and so is our teacher, Mr. Jackson, and nobody else can see him. It's strange how people keep repeating that they can't believe they'll never see him again, and I'm looking right at him. He's not in maths or English. He's at trombone practice. I thought he would be. Tommy, Ricky, and I are, or were in Tommy's case, the only trombone players in the school. We used to share these lessons. Tommy wasn't my friend like Ricky is, but I liked him. He never made fun of me or anyone else. Not even Elsa, who always smells like rotten milk with an added yuck. Mr. Jackson asks if we want to talk about Tommy. I look at Tommy. He doesn't move or meet my eye. Mr. Jackson turns around to see what I'm looking at and seems confused. I shake my head. I don't want to talk about Tommy. How can I with him stood right there? Tommy looks sadder now, and there's somehow something angrier in the way he's standing and the blank look on his face. I wish he would go away. He should be in heaven. Why isn't he there? Grandma says we go to heaven when we die. I'm finally alone with Tommy when I'm walking home. I step onto the bridge and he's facing me, stood completely still as usual. I slowly walk up to him. Tommy, I ask nervously. He opens his mouth wider than I thought possible, and a swarm of flies rush out. Their buzzing is the worst sound I've ever heard, until Tommy screams. It's so loud my ears hurt. It's not the type of scream girls make. He sounds in pain. It's like when my dog broke his leg and cried when dad lifted him into the car, but a thousand times worse. I cover my ears and close my eyes. I feel flies on my skin and take my right hand away from my ear to brush them off my clothes and away from my face. My right eardrum feels like it's going to burst. I keep my mouth tightly closed, not wanting any flies to go in. I imagine them crawling inside my throat and stomach and it makes me feel sick. Then Tommy and the flies vanish. They disappear, just like that. I look up ghosts on my dad's computer when I get home. One website says Tommy's body could be possessed. Another says shock and grief can make us imagine seeing people who have died. But I never saw my granddad and I loved him more than Tommy. Another website talks about banshees when I type in screaming ghosts. It says they're an Irish legend and people think they're more evil than they really are because of their horrible screams. Their purpose is to protect the family they watch over. They scream when a death is about to happen. A death they can't stop. I turn off the computer. It's making me more scared and confused. I think about Tommy during dinner. I drop my knife in fright when the phone rings. My dad gets up, sighing that his fish pie has been interrupted, as if there aren't worse things wrong in the world. It's Mr. Jackson. From what I can gather, he's telling dad I'm falling behind with trombone and I won't be ready for my exam next month. I don't understand. I practice nearly every day and I thought I was doing good. I've got through the main piece three times without making a mistake once. After hanging up the phone, Dad tells me Mr. Jackson has offered to give me private lessons after school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Dad says Mr. Jackson teaches adult students on weekends and has a music studio at his house. It sounds cool. Tomorrow is Tuesday, so it'll take my mind off Tommy. Maybe I can ask Mr. Jackson about ghosts when Ricky isn't around to make fun of me. I thought I wouldn't be able to sleep. Then mom is waking me up for school. I don't see Tommy all day. Perhaps I imagined seeing him yesterday. Or maybe I was in shock like the website said. Perhaps he missed the train to heaven and had to wait the whole day for the next one. Mom drops me off outside Mr. Jackson's house. His music room is cool. 
There are 20 guitars, a piano, and four trombones. He tells me to play my main exam piece. I don't make any mistakes until he starts rubbing my shoulders and stroking my face. Then he tries to reach between my legs. I don't know why, but this feels wrong, and suddenly I think I know how Tommy died. I swing my trombone into Mr. Jackson's face and run. The front door is locked. I can't open the windows. His angry footsteps are coming. I run into the basement. There's an open window, but I can't reach it. I grab a chair and climb up, pulling myself through the tiny window. I breathe in sweet air. Tommy helped me. He came back from the dead to warn me about Mr. Jackson. I wish I could repay him. Then a hand tightens around my ankle, and I remember why Banshees scream. Everyone is looking at Mrs. Craddock when she says I died last night. Except Ricky. He's looking at me. The bond between twins is extraordinary. It's like having your own brain and sharing a mind at the same time. My parents had two pairs of twins. First our brothers, and then us, Ella and me. We're two halves of a whole. We could have entire conversations without speaking. After graduating from high school, we decided to take a week-long camping trip in the mountains with our friends. We were going off to separate universities in the autumn. This had been a difficult decision to make. Even our friends and family sometimes had difficulty telling us apart, with us being identical twins with very similar personalities. Our parents thought we'd always have the same interests, but we planned to pursue different career paths. Ella was going to study human rights and work in law, whereas I love health and fitness and wanted to be a personal trainer or a nutritional therapist. Our friends were also moving to various parts of the country to continue their studies. Aside from Ella's boyfriend, Ben, who was staying local to train as a mechanic at his dad's garage, along with Ella, Ben, and myself, our camping party was made up of Ben's best mate, Frazier. I had always got on well with him until our final year of high school, when he started flirting with me and making unwanted advances. And our friend Rachel, who we'd known since preschool, the drive to the mountains was fun, if a little bittersweet. Knowing our time together in life as we'd known it was coming to an end. We reminisced about our school years, laughing about moments none of us would forget. We left our car in the parking area and embarked on the four-hour hike to our usual camping spot. It was secluded. We had made the trip many times before and only saw a few other hikers on the way. There was never anybody at the clearing where we camped, and that was how we liked it. This time, however, our sanctuary had been invaded by a group of dodgy-looking men, at least ten years older than us. They were smoking and seemed very drunk for 2pm on a Tuesday. Two of them kept ogling Rachel, whilst another looked at Ella like she was a piece of meat. He noticed me and made a joke I didn't quite hear about there being two of us. I glanced at Ella. We wanted to leave. I didn't like making assumptions about people without getting to know them, but I couldn't shake this uneasy feeling. There were six of them, all men, and only five of us. Fraser looked apprehensive. Ben didn't seem bothered and started setting up camp, but Ella pulled him aside and they had a murmured conversation. Fraser joined them. Rachel clung to my arm. She was shivering despite the hot summer breeze. She was nervous as well. This offers me some comfort when my mind returns to this moment, wondering for the thousandth time if those men were harmless and we could have enjoyed our trip unscathed. If I hadn't been so quick to judge them by their rough appearance and drunken comments. This wasn't an official campsite, so no park ranger was going to check on us. But most of us had knives. It's a good idea when you're camping. Perhaps we could have defended ourselves, even if there had been trouble with the men. But then, I think of Rachel, shaking with her nails digging into my arm, and I know at least our group was largely in agreement. Nobody but Ben felt safe around those men. Ben beckoned us over and told us Fraser knew of another clearing about an hour away, if we didn't want camp near the men. We nodded in agreement, desperate to leave. 
I was slightly in doubt because there's no signal deep in the mountains, so none of us bothered to bring our phones. But our parents knew exactly where we were. If we left, nobody would know where to find us. I worried about what would happen if there was an emergency back home or if something happened to us. But I didn't want to camp with the men and the others were already walking on ahead. Frazier's clearing was further away than he thought and we had to tackle rough terrain. We were exhausted and sweating heavily in the heat by the time we got there, but it was beautiful. Lush pine trees surrounded the wide clearing. Breaks in the trees gave us stunning views of the mountains and a nearby lake. Summit stretched up into the clear blue sky and the lake water glistened in the sun. Our usual camping spot was surrounded by very dense woodland with overhead branches blocking out most of the light. This place was much better and I wondered why Frazier hadn't told us about it before. I guessed because of the treacherous climb to get here. I had a feeling it would be even tougher going back down. The hike had been closer to three hours. He probably played it down to Ben because he didn't want to camp with those men. Let's go swimming, Ella suggested once we had finished setting up our tents. She was already in her bikini and Ben looked at her in adoration. I wondered if they'd stay together after Ella left for college. I hoped so. He was a good boyfriend, nothing like the stream of cheating losers I had dated. Rachel hadn't fared much better in the romance department. Her last boyfriend put her nudes online and was sleeping with three other girls. Frazier hadn't had a girlfriend yet. Ella and Ben were lucky to have each other. Shall we go for a walk? Frazier asked me. I looked around for Rachel, but she had gone swimming as well. I didn't want to get in the water, but I didn't want to be alone with Frazier either. I reluctantly agreed to the walk. I knew Frazier wouldn't hurt me, even if he never shut up, about how we should be a couple. You know, I could defer my college placement a year and go with you so you won't be alone, he said. You know, without a leaving and all, I know that will be hard for you. I held in a sigh, not wanting to hurt his feelings. That's very kind of you, but you have to think of your own future, I replied. I really hoped he would find a girlfriend at university so our friendship could go back to the way it used to be. Frazier went to say something else, but it was interrupted by a snapping twig, followed by rustling. It sounded like a large animal. What the hell was that? I whispered. I left my bear spray at camp, Frazier said. I left mine at home. We both laughed quietly and walked swiftly back to camp in silence. I kept glancing behind but saw nothing. We cooked dinner around the campfire and continued to reminisce about the past while we ate. Ella, do you remember that school trip? Rachel began, interrupting herself with giggles. Yes, Ella said, looking at me. We both remembered it well. We were at an outdoor swimming pool. I shoved Ella playfully because she was making fun of me. She tripped over her own feet and stumbled into a woman. Ella ended up laying on the concrete at the pool's edge and the woman was knocked into the water, fully clothed. Ella then hid, so it was me the woman was pointing at furiously when she emerged from the pool. Our teachers really struggled to calm the woman down. Does anyone want to roast marshmallows? Ben asked. I need to pee first, Rachel said. She went into the woods with a flashlight. Then we heard rustling again, in the opposite direction from where Rachel had headed. I hope it's not that bear again, Frazier said. What bear? Ella asked, sounding worried. Get your spray, I told Frazier. Then to Ben and Ella, I said, Remember, it's brown lie down, black fight back, white say good night. Could it actually be a polar bear? Ella asked. She could be a little dim sometimes. Ben laughed. That's when the night was pierced by Rachel's ear splitting scream. At first, I thought she was playing a prank on us, but it wasn't the type of scream anyone could fake. It was a cry of terror and pain, of death. I looked at the others, and I knew they were thinking the same from the dread in their eyes. We have to go after her, Ella said, but it was more of a question. On some level, we knew it wasn't the wisest idea because Rachel was dead and we'd be walking towards whatever attacked her. Let's get our knives, Ben said. Then I'll find Rachel 
and the rest of you stay here. If I don't, I saw the figure a split second before it pounced. I didn't have time to call out a warning before it launched itself at Ben, tackling him to the ground. It was hard to see in the dark, but I could tell it was a humanoid creature from the light of our campfire, much taller than anyone I had ever met, probably close to eight feet. It had matted black hair that reached midway down its thighs. I assumed it was male because it was broad and flat-chested, but it didn't appear to have any genitalia. Ben kicked out, his foot connecting with the creature's face. Its head was smacked towards me. I saw deep, black empty sockets where its eyes were supposed to be. Its nose was just two narrow slits. Its lips, either non-existent or peeled back to reveal sharp pointed teeth. I remember thinking it was a zombie and wondering if the undead apocalypse had begun worldwide and whether our parents and brothers were okay. Frazier sprayed his bear repellent in the thing's face. It cried out in a guttural noise that wasn't quite human. There's another one, Ella screamed, but it was too late. The second creature sprinted from the direction Rachel had gone, running on all fours at a pace faster than any human would be capable. It wasn't as tall as the first one, but it towered over Frazier and lifted him off his feet. Frazier tried to get the thing with the spray, but the angle was awkward because he was dangling and couldn't see behind. I was about to tell him to throw the spray to me when the thing tore his neck open with its teeth. Frazier was almost decapitated when the creature tossed him to the ground. Ella clung to me. We were both too petrified to move. We didn't know what to do or where to go. The creatures were so fast. The second creature struck Ben's face with a clawed hand. It sliced through his head three or four inches deep. I ran from my tent to get my knife. A weapon was our best hope. Before I got there, the creatures surrounded me, the first, having mostly recovered from the bear spray. Run, Ella, I screamed. Moments before the one in front of me, the one covered in the blood of our three friends, backhanded me with a force beyond that of any human. My vision went black as I fell to the ground. I woke up on cold, hard ground. My head was throbbing. The stench of rotting was horrific. I tried to use my arms to sit up, but they were above my head and I couldn't pull them down. Something made a clanging sound when I tried. I rolled onto my stomach and waited for the wave of dizziness to pass. My hands were cuffed through an iron loop in the wall. So were Ella's. She was lying beside me, unconscious. Some of her hair was matted red from a head wound, but she was breathing. Tears of relief filled my eyes. I pulled hard against my handcuffs, but their chain and the iron loop in the wall were too strong. The nails holding the loop in place weren't giving in either. An oil lantern lit the limited space. We were in a cave. I closed my eyes in terror, desperately wanting to unsee the human and animal bones that littered the dusty ground. The creatures returned, carrying the bodies of our friends. I was relieved Ella wasn't awake to see them tear people we loved and known most of our whole lives, limb from limb, gorging on their flesh like cannibals. I closed my eyes, but the sound of their soggy chomping and the occasional clash of teeth on bone made me wretch. One came over and licked my vomit from the ground. Please, let us go, I croaked. My voice came out, barely audible. I wasn't sure if the thing heard or understood me. The worst was yet to come. The next day, I woke up to find Ella awake. She was quivering, tears poured silently from her eyes, making tracks on her dirty face. She was staring at Ben's body. Above the waist, he was nothing but a skeleton. His bones almost picked clean. The rotting stench was stronger than usual. I had been getting used to it up to that point. I turned round to find one of the creatures sitting cross-legged beside me, gazing down at me. At first, I feared being raped, but I saw no lust on its face. I was also certain it had no genitalia. Now I could see it up close. It didn't touch me. It just stared at me with an intense look of concentration on its face. What do you want? I asked. 
Just let us go. You'll be safe. Nobody will believe us. They're saving us to eat later, Ella said, almost emotionless. Being here was taking its toll on her mentality. It would on anyone. But Ella was closing off and losing her fighting spirit. That night, they tried to feed us Rachel's flesh. We refused, and they scratched us all over our bodies with their long, sharp nails as punishment. Ella soon gave in. She was half in shock and had no strength. I kept trying to fight, clamping my teeth closed and moving my head away from the thing's fingers. One stopped feeding Ella to hold my head still, while the other forced meat down my throat, its nails tearing the inside of my mouth as I struggled. I swallowed a few mouthfuls, but I soon threw up. Once again, one of the things devoured my vomit. We had to relieve ourselves in our pants. I begged the thing to let me clean up, but they wouldn't untie us. Ella wrapped her ankle around mine while we slept, because we couldn't hold hands. I lost track of time. I didn't know how many days had passed. I slept a lot. I think it was my body's way of sparing me this torment. I jerked in shock when I woke up and saw half of Ella's hair had turned black. Her blonde locks had been brown with mud and grease before. Now it was jet black. There was no way that could just be dirt. Her skin seemed to have grayed as well. I knew I looked similar from the way she was looking at me. You have a black streak in your hair, she mumbled. I studied my arms and legs. My skin had a gray tint, but it was lighter and patchier than Ella's. We're turning into them, Ella said. This seemed impossible, but the next day after more force feeding, Ella's eyes darkened and shifted further into her face. Her hair was entirely black. The things went hunting regularly, usually coming back with animals. It's quite rare for humans to stray off the popular hiking trails. We must be a rare delicacy for them. There had been semi-frequent reports of people going missing, but when their bodies weren't found, it was usually put down to misadventure, or the people having never arrived here in the first place. Later that day, when the things were out hunting, Ella pulled at her cuffs with so much force, the chain snapped. It was crazy seeing her break free so easily, after we had both tried and failed for days on end. She grabbed my arms and tugged me forwards, breaking the chain off my cuffs. Run, she growled, struggling to force her voice out. I stumbled to my feet, my body numb and weak after days of inactivity. I moved towards the mouth of the cave, but Ella wasn't behind me. She was sitting against the wall. What are you doing? Come on, I urged. You have to go, she begged me. I'm going to hurt you if you don't. I was confused until I glimpsed what remained of Fraser's body. I felt an almost uncontrollable desire to bite into his severed leg. We were turning into them. Ella's eyes told me everything I needed to know. It was too late for her. I staggered out into the woodland, but we weren't near our campsite. I had no idea where to go. I chose a random direction and moved as fast as I could. My injured limbs were difficult to navigate at first, after days of being held captive, and my soiled clothes weighed me down, but my sports background and the speed and strength I'd inherited from the creatures helped. Soon, I found myself moving at an almost superhuman speed. I would have got a gold medal if this were the Olympics. I heard a car passing somewhere ahead, but my body weakened as I ran towards the sound. The road was in sight, at the top of a grassy slope. When the trees rustled beside me, one of the things leapt out, knocking me off my feet. It straddled me and raised a clawed hand. Before it could strike, a second thing threw itself at my attacker, sending it tumbling off me. The second one was smaller than the first. It was Ella. There wasn't much left of my sister visually, aside from her smaller form and shorter claws. She looked exactly like them, but she wasn't acting like them, not yet. She was pinning my attacker to the ground. Our eyes met. The bond between twins is extraordinary. It's like having your own brain and sharing a mind at the same time. Without words, we said our goodbyes. I climbed up the slope to the main road and ran in front of an approaching car. 
I didn't want to put my thumb out, knowing they probably wouldn't stop. I needed help now. The screech of the brakes was the last thing I heard before the car slammed into me. I woke up in the hospital, our parents at my bedside. I cried, telling them Ella was lost. I told the police we were attacked by savage humans, knowing they wouldn't believe the real story. I made sure the descriptions I gave were significantly different from those of the men we met at our usual camping spot. I didn't want them getting the blame. I said Ella and our friends were dead when I escaped. The police searched the area close to where I was hit by the car, but found nothing. My hair returned to its usual shade of blonde, but my skin remained slightly gray. I often get nasty comments hurled at me on the street. People say I look like a walking corpse. I don't mind my coloring. In a weird way, it makes me feel closer to Ella. I was vegetarian before our ill-fated camping trip. I have no desire to eat human flesh, but I'm no longer a veggie. I often wake up in the middle of the night, craving raw steak. I did some research, and I think we were attacked by Wendigo. It's believed they came to exist when ancient cannibals ate their fellow man alive. This act of evil turned them into dark creatures. They don't breed in the usual way. New Wendigo are formed when humans are kept in close proximity to Wendigo for a few days, often being force-fed human flesh. This much I had worked out for myself. Wendigo apparently live with an insatiable hunger, never satisfied no matter how much they eat. Some people believe Wendigo can't be happy for this reason. I hope this isn't true. Ella isn't living the life we planned, but she's still out there. I've thought about looking for her, but I know she wouldn't want me to put myself in danger. We won't meet again in this life, but she's always with me. I hope part of me remains with her and helps her navigate the rest of our life as a Wendigo. The moon was almost full, but the overhanging trees meant its light wasn't close to sufficient. Roger's flashlight only invaded a few metres of the darkness ahead. We should have brought a flashlight each, but I doubt it would have offered a great deal more light or comfort. As we walked slowly down the path, leaves crunched and twigs snapped around us from all directions. Roger flung his light this way and that, but failed to find the sources of the sounds. I knew it was probably just animals, a badger perhaps, maybe mice or squirrels, possibly even wandering house cats, but this didn't stop my heart from hammering or my mind from envisioning the worst. I wasn't expecting a complete absence of artificial lighting at the cemetery. I wondered if there was a reason for the lack of streetlights. Maybe people just aren't supposed to visit graveyards at 1.30 in the morning. Cheyenne was breathing heavily beside me. Guys, I'm not sure about this, she whispered. We've been over this, babe, Roger replied. We'll be in and out. I agreed with Cheyenne, but there was no point voicing this opinion. Jody knew I didn't think this plan was a good idea. In fact, I thought it was a phenomenally terrible idea. But Jody wasn't to be dissuaded, and I wasn't going to let her do this without me. Roger and Cheyenne were our closest friends and good people in general, but I was aware of their flaws. I didn't trust Roger to have Jody's best interests at heart, or to protect her if anything went wrong. We had attended Joel Larkin's funeral a few days earlier. We watched as he was laid to rest in this very cemetery. He had been an elderly and incredibly wealthy man. Jody worked for him back in the day when he was starting to build his property empire. Roger was a friend of his son. I noticed Roger and Jody perk up and exchange glances when the vicar mentioned Mr Larkin would be buried with his beloved jewels and family emblems. Why the family thought it wise to make this fact known to every Tom, Dick and Harry is beyond my comprehension. They may as well have announced it in the local paper or on that TikTok thing the kids use these days. Jody's brother is a recovering gambling addict. He's worked really hard to get back on track, 
but debts don't go away. This is why I found myself in the graveyard, the wrong side of midnight, with my wife, our greedy friend, and his timid other half. Roger scanned the graves with his flashlight until he found Mr Larkins. The soil and flowers were still fresh. This isn't right, I told the others. I hadn't planned to bother protesting again, but I felt I had to. Now we were in front of the grave we planned to rob. Old man Lark is not going to miss him, is he? Roger said without a hint of remorse. Let's just get on with it, he continued. Shy, you walk down that way. Jode, you go back that way and tell us if anyone's coming. Jodie looked at me. I'll dig, Tom can watch, she said. I flashed her a grateful smile. I didn't want to see Mr Larkin's cold, dead face as we robbed him blind. I walked back the way we came. I thought it was probably for the best I didn't bring a flashlight. I could have used my phone, but decided against it because the light might attract attention. I could just about see the path ahead and the nearest graves on each side. When the entrance was in sight, I heard movement to the right much louder than anything from before. I spun round in horror, convinced something was there. I was about to rush back to the others when I noticed a large black dog appear behind a nearby gravestone. I breathed a sigh of relief, glad it wasn't the police or a gang of rival thieves that would leave us for dead, but the dog still put me on edge. I couldn't see its eyes in the dark, but I sensed it looking at me. I vaguely remembered reading something about black dogs being bad omens. This reasserted my fear that what we were doing was a terrible idea, but the dog didn't seem like it was about to attack. I stood statue still until it padded away. Minutes later, Cheyenne screamed loud enough to wake the dead. Very concerning considering where we were. I ran back to the others, my heart thudding, desperate to know what was happening. My mind feared the worst and showed me images of Jodie Hurt or worse. There was black smoke! Cheyenne screeched. Shut the hell up! Roger hissed. Someone will hear you! Aren't you hearing me? Cheyenne cried. It was thick black smoke moving like a monster, a smoke monster. There's no such thing as bloody smoke monsters, Roger insisted, looking exasperated. It was probably from a chimney or something, Jody added. What chimney? Cheyenne replied. Why don't you believe me? Look, I said, keeping my voice tranquil, hoping this would have a calming effect on Cheyenne. I do believe you, but I don't think it's anything to worry about. We're almost done. You stay here with the others. I'll walk back and forth on my own to check the coast is clear. Jody and Roger were standing in the grave with a huge pile of dirt on the ground above them. I was sure they were close to reaching the coffin. Then we could grab the loot, refill the grave and leave. Cheyenne started sobbing. Jody climbed out of the grave to comfort her. That's when the beast leapt out from the dark. It was on Roger before I had processed what I was seeing. It must have been about seven feet tall. Huge muscles bulged beneath its black furred body. Its claws were the length of my forearm. Cheyenne screamed and pulled away from Jody, running towards the exit. I saw her trip on the path before I turned my attention back to Roger. He was grunting in pain, but managed to get out from under the beast. Jody pulled him out of the grave. His shirt was torn and darkened with blood, but he didn't look seriously hurt. He pulled a knife from the back of his jeans. It was a decent sized kitchen knife. Roger drove the knife towards the beast's chest as it leapt from the grave. I was sure the beast was a goner, but it turned to smoke a split second before the blade made contact. Jody gasped in amazement. I was too dumbfounded to move. What the hell? Roger muttered as the smoke formed itself into a small tornado and rushed away. Let's get out of here, Jody said urgently. Roger looked down at the grave reluctantly, but decided Jody was right. We had taken a couple of hurried steps towards the exit when the beast pounced. Roger was thrown to the ground. The knife fell from his hand and spun out of sight. Jody screamed as the beast mauled Roger. He made a few squeals of alarm before the beast tore into his neck with its dog-like snout. Roger went still and silent after that. A puddle of blood formed beneath him. Cheyenne appeared behind us and shrieked in grief. Jody took Cheyenne in her arms and I pushed the women behind me. I held out my arms like an aeroplane, partly to keep the women behind and partly to make myself seem bigger. Apparently, this can prevent a predator attacking. 
the beast snarled at me, with Roger's blood dripping from its jaw and canine teeth. It radiated hatred in a way I didn't think animals were capable of. I knew running would be pointless. The beast would easily outrun us, and running would also make us look like prey. We're leaving, I told the beast. Let us go. I took a small step back, and then another, walking backwards with the girls behind me, never taking my eyes off the beast. It didn't move. When we had backed up enough that the beast was out of sight, I turned and we ran as swiftly and quietly as we could. We made it through the cemetery gates and to the car. I couldn't quite believe we made it. I had been expecting the beast to throw itself at my back at any moment, knocking me to the ground. I went online as soon as we got home. I'm fairly sure the beast was a hellhound. Apparently a hellhound's purpose is to protect the graveyard and its occupants. Clearly grave robbers aren't welcome. I'm not usually one to believe in the supernatural, but I have no other explanation. I saw the beast turn to smoke with my own eyes. Cheyenne is staying with us while she comes to terms with Roger's death. I think in time she'll find someone better. Roger wasn't a bad man, but his greed infiltrated all aspects of his life, including women. I had to return to the cemetery a few days later because I always place flowers on my grandmother's grave on what would have been her birthday. I was extremely nervous, but the cemetery was less daunting on a bright summer's morning. Families and lone mourners were dotted around. A girl of about seven was sobbing alone by a gravestone. I wanted to ask if she needed to talk, but thought better of it. If the parents appeared, my intentions could have been misinterpreted. Mr. Larkin's grave was recovered as if nothing had happened. Roger's body was gone and there was no evidence of his passing. We assumed the hellhound must have disposed of Roger when his body wasn't discovered the next day. Cheyenne decided it would be easiest to tell people Roger had left to live in Spain with another woman. Jody and I promised to give her an alibi if his whereabouts is ever questioned. His parents are dead and he hasn't spoken to his brother in 20 years. We were his closest friends. If his other friends and work colleagues buy the story, it's possible no one will report him missing. As I left the cemetery, I saw the little girl cuddling a large black dog. The animal scowled at me. I offered it a weak and apologetic smile, feeling very relieved I wouldn't need to visit the cemetery for another year. He wasn't problematic initially. I first saw him outside my local grocery shop. He didn't throw his signature wink or wide grin that day. I caught a glimpse of him, of me, as he was leaving, and I was entering. He looked exactly like me, except he was wearing different clothes. I did a double take, but he walked on, not seeming to notice me. I thought I must have been mistaken. I was about to call out to him, but the sound of the commotion inside the shop stole my attention. It was Crazy Clara, a student from the school where I teach. She was pouring a bottle of milk over her head, while a group of boys roared with laughter. I shooed them away. Clara's always been slightly odd, but aside from having hair down to her knees, she doesn't really stand out much. She was a quiet and studious girl, but had recently started causing chaos, from instigating fights to following people around like a little creep. You have to pay for that, the staff member said. Clara didn't even look in his direction. An elderly woman fumbled with her purse and gave the man a two-pound coin. I went to ask Clara what was going on, but the woman stood protectively between us. I think she lives on my street. I'll deal with this. She spoke to me in a scolding tone that irked me. I almost pointed out that as her teacher, I was in a higher position of trust than an alleged neighbour but decided it was easier to wash my hands of the fiasco. I knew I wouldn't have time to see Holly before Meg got back from her sister's party, if I didn't get a move on. Clara was probably acting out, for attention, anyway. Over the following weeks, there were other strange occurrences. People were surprised to see me in one place, claiming to have just seen me in another. They acted like I teleported, 
I joked that perhaps I had a double wandering around, not for a moment suspecting this was actually the case. The situation escalated when I arrived at my classroom one morning to see through the glass in the door that I was already inside. The other me caught my eye and shot me a wicked grin. I couldn't walk in because the students would have been shocked to see two of us, so I had to wait while some lunatic talked my class. At first I thought I must have a twin my parents never told me about, but I kept seeing the other me around, and it became clear he didn't look like me. He was me. We had piercings in the exact same place. Sometimes his outfit and hairstyle would match mine perfectly and an identical scar above his left eyebrow. I researched similar cases online. There was a woman that kept losing jobs because they were frightened of her mysterious double. Many sources claimed doppelgangers are a bad omen. Apparently, seeing yours can foreshadow imminent death. But I wasn't worried. It was superstitious nonsense. Other paranormal enthusiasts suggest such events are a glitch in the matrix, and usually harmless. I wasn't concerned until his benign presence began to become malignant. He sent my wife pictures of me with another woman, except the photos were of him, because I had never met the woman. He began causing problems for me at work by insulting my colleagues and acting inappropriately towards students. Luckily, the affected students weren't the most reliable of sources, so because there was nothing too serious, I was given the benefit of the doubt. But the parents kicked up a storm, and I knew I would be fired if I didn't put a stop to the situation. I was confident I had the upper hand after the incident with my wife. It was clear the other me couldn't read my thoughts or anticipate my next move, because otherwise, he wouldn't have bothered contacting Meg when I was planning to leave her for Holly anyway. If anything, he had done me a favour, because this mystery woman would face most of the backlash. Meg's friend and family could be brutal. I thought if I played it right, I could pretend to leave Meg for the unknown woman, and later say it didn't work out. Holly could then appear on the scene as my new girlfriend, and be spared all the judgement. I swiftly hatched a plan to rib myself of the other me. He seemed to take any opportunity to stir trouble at work, so I set a trap. Mrs. Smith asked if I could cover for her after-school detention, so that she could attend a last-minute hospital appointment. I would have normally said no, but this time I agreed. I replaced her name with my own on the rotor in the staff room, writing it in big letters so it could be seen from afar. Only three boys were down for detention. I told them it was cancelled due to staff shortages and we would let them off, but they'd face double punishment if they repeated their crimes. I arrived at the detention room a few minutes late. The other me was always early. I had the rope wrapped around his throat before he knew what was happening. He was strong, I'm strong, so he fought hard, but this wasn't my first rodeo. My gran displayed more fight than I expected of a terminally ill bag of bones when I smothered her with a pillow. She hadn't left me much choice. She was 93 and needed to move on, so that I could divorce Meg. I was worried she'd take me out of the will otherwise. She always had a soft spot for my soon-to-be ex-wife, not knowing what a nagging bitch she could be at home. I heard the small cough behind me. I turned in horror to see Clara. I made an instant plan to kill her too, but the calm expression on her face held me back. She told me, It's over now. They appear after you murder someone. Mine showed up after I drowned my cousin in the bath. I wondered if I should go after her with a rope, but my gut said she wouldn't tell, and even if she did, who would believe her? She was known for making accusations to cause trouble, plus the victim, me, didn't exist. How could I kill myself and still be alive? 
that would just need to get the body out or hidden before she could bring anyone back. Clara continued talking. I drowned my doppelganger in the toilet. I thought another one would show up, but it didn't. Your soul tears in half when you end a life in cold blood, like what happened to Voldemort. I think the doppelganger is like the torn half. With that, she sorted out. I swiped my arms across the shelf in fury, sending science equipment and students' projects clattering to the floor. I knew it wasn't over yet, not for me. My soul has more than two pieces, as I've killed four people. Halloween used to be my favorite time of year. It wasn't just the night itself. I loved playing pranks on my friends and teachers on Devil's Night or the last day of term. And the parties where girls wore sexy costumes went on throughout October. Corey always knew when they were happening and how to get invited. I'll be laying low this Halloween to keep my condition under control. It started early October last year. Mom forced me to take Cam and her friend Gabriella pumpkin picking because they needed to make jack-o'-lanterns for a school project. I didn't mind that much, to be honest. I knew it wouldn't take long. And although most of my friends hated their siblings, I got on well with Cam, so I was down for helping her out. But Corey was pissed about having to make a detour on the way to Shelly's party. Gabriella slept over at our house the night before we went to the pumpkin farm, but she lived close to Shelly. So the plan was, we dropped the girls at her place with the pumpkins before going to Shelley's. You know you can buy pumpkins at literally any supermarket, Corey complained on the drive to the pumpkin patch. They won't be as high quality, Cam countered from the back seat. This project is a huge part of our final grade. It needs to look perfect. Cam wanted to go to art college, so her grade was important to her. I'm not sure about Gabriella's college plans, but she was a good friend of my sister. And she was hot. I remember wishing she was a few years older. Her age didn't deter Corey judging from the way he was looking at her, but Gabriella didn't seem to notice, so I assumed she wasn't interested. Not that this would necessarily deter Corey either, as long as he wasn't going after Cam. I wasn't bothered. I hope we get to Shelley's before Troy leaves, Corey said. Do you know he's going out of town, he added, looking at me. So, who else can hook us up with GHB? There's no us in that scenario, I told him. That's not what you said last year when you wanted that guy's Rolex. I glanced at the girls in the rearview mirror, but they were giggling at something on Cam's phone and didn't appear to have heard our conversation. A narrow country lane led to the pumpkin farm. I was relieved when we reached the car park before anything came the other way. The girls leapt out of the car excitedly. I had to jog to keep up as they ran towards a wooden bridge, which I guessed was the entrance. A sign stood in front of it, reading, Bella's Pumpkins. Gabriella stopped abruptly halfway across the bridge, causing Cam to crash into her back. Did you feel that? Gabby asked. What? The wave of heat? No, Cam replied in confusion. I laughed. It was a cold October's day, and there was no wind, as if there'd been a wave of heat. We haven't got all day, Corey snapped behind me. Gabby kept walking. I feel it now, Cam said. I was hit by a blast of hot air a second later. It was there, and gone in a flash. Me too, Corey said. I didn't feel it again, Gabby told us, sounding worried. I replied, I'm sure it's nothing. I wouldn't have noticed if you hadn't said anything. The girls went on ahead, their welly boots squelching in the mud. Bloody hell, Corey muttered. I suppressed a laugh, watching him navigate the mud in his white, Gucci trainers. Muddy hell, more like. I joked, relieved I was wearing my beat-up converses. I felt the grin slide from my face when I turned a corner and saw the pumpkin field. Most of the pumpkins were rotten, and there was a mild stench of decay in the air. The trees, bushes, and flowers around the field were also half-dead. 
most of their leaves black and withered. What the? Corey mumbled. Then I noticed the girls. Gabriella was holding up a pumpkin so decomposed it was covered in mold and caving in on itself. Ants crawled from its surface up her arms and flies buzzed around her head, but it was like she didn't notice. She smiled for the camera as Cam took a picture. I knew Gabby hated bugs. It didn't make sense. This will look great on Instagram, Cam said, rushing over to me. She showed me the photo on her phone. I did a double take. The image on the screen showed Gabby posing with a healthy orange pumpkin, and there were no bugs in sight. I looked up to see the real Gabby, carefully putting the rotten pumpkin in a wheelbarrow. High quality my ass, Corey scoffed. Cam looked at him with a confused expression, and then went back to Gabriella. This place isn't right, man, I said. Corey had his sweater pulled up to cover his mouth and nose. The smell wasn't that bad. Do you think these black particles are toxic? He asked. I looked around, unable to see any black particles. It's like the Upside Down in Stranger Things, Corey added. I asked, where are the particles? He looked at me like I was crazy. They're everywhere, dude. Are you blind or something? Cam appeared at my side again. Selfie, she hollered, holding up her phone in front of us. I leant in, but stumbled back when I saw myself on screen. Half of my face was skinless and bloody, with sections missing like something had taken bites out of my flesh. I tripped over a mound of dirt and landed on my back in the mud. Corey burst out laughing. Cam ran over to help me up. What happened? She asked. I grabbed the phone from her hand and pulled up the camera roll. I was midway through falling in the photo, but my face was normal. Gabby came over, pushing a wheelbarrow full of rank pumpkins. Shall we pay? She asked. For those, Corey said in disgust. What's wrong with them? That's it. I'm going back to the car. I threw Corey my keys when he started power walking back towards the bridge. He wasn't even trying to avoid the mud anymore. It suddenly occurred to me that he might leave without us, but it was too late. He was out of sight and didn't respond when I called his name. So I followed the girls to the gift shop. I decided to hope he wouldn't risk being pulled over in a car he wasn't insured to drive. The shelves in the gift shop were full of dusty jars. The bread and baked goods were crawling with mold. Spiders scurried among the donuts. But this didn't stop Cam putting a Homer Simpson style ring with pink icing and sprinkles in a paper bag. Want one? She asked me. Uh, no. Cam placed her donut bag on the counter. The shop attendant was counting the pumpkins in the wheelbarrow. Are you Bella? Gabby asked. No, I'm Jackie. Bella was my sister. We opened this place in her memory. She took her own life after years of torment at the hands of bullies. I'm sorry to hear that, Gabby replied. I get bullied at school sometimes. I'm lucky to have Cam by my side. Cam had been suspended a few months earlier for throwing a milkshake at a girl that was harassing Gabby. It pissed me off that nothing was done about the other girl, but I learned a long time ago that if you hit back harder, people soon forget who threw the first punch. Bella was always mocked for her looks, Jackie told the girls. They said her name was ironic because she wasn't beautiful. Of course, that wasn't true. If inner beauty was visible on the outside, Bella would have dropped every jaw in town. Did she like Halloween? Is that why you made a pumpkin farm in her honor? Cam inquired. Oh, Bella loved the spooky season, Jackie said with tears in her eyes. It's also when my powers are strongest. What do you mean? Gabby asked. You should ask him. They all turned in my direction, and I realized she was talking about me. Jackie said, you girls have kind souls. The magic of this place isn't meant for you. I'm going to go check on Corey, I told Cam. Hurry up and pay for that crap. I ran back to the car park, falling in the mud twice but not slowing down, not even when I sprained my wrist. I was relieved to see Corey hadn't abandoned us. He didn't seem to notice when I got in the car. He was looking at his reflection in the rearview mirror and scratching aggressively at his face, leaving his cheeks and fingertips bloody. 
I pulled his hands away. It was a struggle to keep him from returning them to his face. What the hell? I half yelled. He looked at me with wild eyes. There's something on my face. I looked at my own face. It wasn't as bad as it had been when Cam was taking the selfie, but there were large warts on my forehead and chin, and a layer of white fluffy mold stretched across my nose and cheeks. The way it looked sewn into my skin was revolting and made me feel sick. I don't think it's real, I told Corey, not sure he was hearing me. Don't touch it, it's not really there. The girls loaded their pumpkins into the car and got in the back seat. I turned to Cam. Is there something on my face? Other than your big nose? She laughed. She wasn't being cruel. She knew I knew she was joking. No, nothing, she added when she noticed my expression. What's going on? Just get us out of here, Corey snapped. Unfortunately, leaving Bella's pumpkins wasn't the end of our nightmare. Shops and other buildings we passed on the way to the farm that looked normal then were now crumbling and crawling with knotweed. I thought the visions might fade after 24 hours, but they didn't. From that day forward, it was like viewing the world through a filter other people couldn't see. All the groceries at home looked gone off, but tasted fine when mom served dinner. I was only able to refuse food for so long before I got too hungry to continue. My appetite returned once I got used to it tasting better than it looked. Half the time when I saw Corey and most of our friendship group, any exposed skin on their bodies was crawling with mold or other disfigurations I knew weren't really there. Even when their skin looked clear, their appearance was somehow dulled. Whereas people like Cam, the kind souls, seemed to glow. At first it angered me because nobody is perfect. But then I figured, it must be like a school or college exam. You don't need to score 100% to get an A, but you have to be at a certain level. A year on, my surroundings have improved as I've tried to become a better person. Corey is in a mental health facility. I suspect our curse was worse for him, and it sent him over the edge. I don't think he had the best childhood, so I hope the curse will ease in light of that if he stops his most destructive behavior. I'm thinking about going back to Bella's farm to Dr. Jackie on his behalf, but the thought of returning to that place fills me with dread. Cam would do it for Gabby if the roles were reversed, so I guess I should take a leaf from her book. It's not all bad. I can identify the worst of humanity. My cousin was engaged to a man with the most rotten face I've seen since that day at the pumpkin farm. He even had worms crawling in and out of the holes in his cheeks. Luckily, Cam believes me about the curse, and she came up with an ingenious plot to convince my cousin the guy was cheating. So the wedding was cancelled. We didn't care whether he was actually cheating. He was bad news either way. Six months later, he was in the newspaper for beating his new partner to death. I can recognize the best of humanity too. I met my girlfriend Maddie a few months ago. She's the most beautiful person I've ever known, inside and out. I hope I never lose the curse entirely because it protects the people I care about. I'm getting worried the more it continues to fade. I don't want it to get worse, but I hope it doesn't disappear altogether either. I think this is the reason I'm sharing my story. Maybe if Jackie resents me for warning others about Bella's pumpkins, my curse will remain.